busy people getting fit in Fulcher, Texas. Our aim is to help you look better, feel better, and perform better as quickly as possible. I'm your host, Brian White, with Blue Eagle Fitness and Nutrition. Welcome. Hey, what's up, everybody? I am here with Dr. Denny. She is actually my vet, or not my vet, but my dog's vet, Toro. Uh, and she is at Four Paws in downtown Fulcher. Welcome, Dr. Denny. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy that you're here. We are here to get to know her a little bit better. Uh, gonna ask, definitely going to ask the question of when should you see her or your vet. Um, and then we're going to uh, learn a little bit more about what she does to stay healthy. So let's get started first with telling us a little bit more about your family, where you're born, where you're raised, and then of course your mom. Okay. Um, so I was born in Tyler, Texas, which is kind of BFE nowhere right now. I've heard it's grown. I haven't been there since I was <laughs> way younger. Um, my mother is a veterinarian, so she actually had me when she was in vet school. Okay. Uh, her interview, because back then it was very frowned upon to have children, um, she wore a girdle to her interview. Uh, and lied because they asked her, do you plan on having children? And she was like five months pregnant with me. <laughs> so, and the answer was no. And then, you know, there I was. So <laughs> okay. the entire class of, I think not like 89, 90, um, they, uh, yes, I grew up in Texas A&M veterinary school. So that entire class, which is most of the specialists in Austin and a good handful of them in Houston know exactly who I am. So <laughs> I've been okay. in this my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. And so where do you live now? So I'm in Firethorn in Katy. Okay. And how did you get from Tyler into Katy? So I grew up after my mom graduated, um, she moved to Austin and took me with her. And I kind of developed out of my three sisters, because I have three sisters, um, I developed a passion for veterinary medicine and pretty much spent a lot of time at the clinic. Um, loved everything about it. I think I wavered for about maybe six months my senior okay. year of high school Okay. and thought I might want to be a pediatrician. And then uh, I think it was my first semester of college. I was like, what am I doing? I know exactly <laughs> what I want to do. And I switched majors, never looked back. But um, so from Austin, went to Texas Tech for my first two years, undergrad, Okay. finished undergrad at A&M, did my best. college station. Yep. Okay. And then I uh, got accepted to Ross University of Veterinary Medicine. Where is that? So it's actually on St. Kitts. It's out of the country. Okay. It's U.S. accredited, um, but it is uh, accelerated. So I did in three years what it usually takes for, okay. um, for veterinary school. Um, and when I came back, my husband, who we met in school, um, he couldn't get a job because he's a petroleum engineer. So Houston <laughs> okay. is kind of the place to be. Okay. So yep. that's how I ended up in Houston. Gotcha. Gotcha. Very cool. And you own Four Paws in downtown Fulcher. Right. When did when did that start? How did all that begin? Like th four months before uh, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good timing. Um, good timing. So it was, uh, we call that a crash course <laughs> in uh, business and uh, natural disaster. So I actually was at Kingsland Boulevard Animal Clinic for about five years. Okay. Um, had a lot of mentorship there. I, a lot of great, great doctors there. And uh, they went corporate. And it was not a great environment anymore. So I decided I always wanted to own my own. So I did it. And we opened in 2019, September. And then a few months later, COVID happened. Okay. And, yeah, um, six months later. Yeah. Yep. So I had to think on my feet. There was a lot of learning. Um, it's strange not being able to have the majority of your clients see your face for the first year. Sure. Um, so sure. You know, it's, uh, I remember the first couple times somebody asked me to lower my mask. They're like, I just want to put a face to the name. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we kind of slid into that. I had an, I interviewed an associate and she asked me a question, which I thought was so funny. She said, what does your practice look like outside of COVID? And I just kind of looked at her and said, <laughs> I'm not sure. We'll find out. Uh, Cause it's there. We had no experience with it. So yeah. it's been a. It's been a journey. <laughs> Very cool. To say the least. But you're there and you're doing well. We are. We're growing. Uh, we have usually me plus one other doctor on every single day. I'm actively trying to convince one of my very best friends from Kingsland to come on board. Um, she's great. 
I'm not going to mention her name because I'm not out in her on here until it's a <laughs> it's a done deal. Okay. Um, but I have a bunch of relief doctors that are there with me that are amazing, and I've got a great team. Cool, very cool. When we think about you personally, what is the most important thing I should know about you? I am probably one of the most honest um, and empathetic people. Like that that's who I am at my core. Um, anybody who knows me, like if there's a client who's listening, um, I don't have a filter. Uh, <laughs> what's in my head is for better or for worse. I, you know, I'm kind, but okay. I'm, I am honest. Uh, so honesty and I'm deeply empathetic. And I think that's part of what makes me such a good veterinarian because you really, I feel what my clients feel. So it's very easy to communicate with them. And when we're in really hard situations and scary diagnosis and, or an emergency, it's, I build trust very quickly because I can feel what they feel. And it's like my greatest strength and my biggest weakness because, you know, it does take a toll. So there's a lot of things that I do outside of the clinic to keep make sure my mental health stays good and make sure my team's taken care of. Um, but I ultimately, I, that's those two biggest things. Is I'm very honest. Um, I'm not going to be, uh, you know, a veterinarian that's going to dance around the hard stuff. Um you know, you're going to hear the truth. It'll be kind. Um, and I will be there with you every step of the way, but I don't shy away from it. Okay. Okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a nutshell, my husband's going to be like, yeah, you don't have a filter. <laughs> nope. No filter. I love it. I love it. So speaking about you as a vet, when should someone see you? So there's like, so that can be a really long question, right? So we're going to try sure. to kind of hit the, yeah, hit the high it. points. Love it. Um, you know, when you first adopt a cat or a dog, you know, you generally want to be established with a veterinarian within the first week. Um, there's a lot of things that can happen to young animals. They tend to get sicker a lot faster than okay. adult animals. They don't have those reserves. So being established with a veterinarian is really important. Okay. You know, within a week, um, some breeder contracts will specify, you know, within 24 to 48 hours. It's good. You get to establish a relationship. Your pet gets to have their first experience at the veterinarian's clinic. And, um, you know, that's really important to have that relationship. So if something does happen, you know where to go, you know who to call. Uh, so that's kind of you're dipping the toes in it. Now to move on a little bit more towards, okay, well, what happens if something's not going well? You know, if my pet, like what are the things that the biggest things that I can look at my dog or cat and say, oh, I probably need to call a veterinarian and get an appointment. Um, not eating. So not eating for more than 24 hours, that's a problem. Okay. Okay. That's an okay. instinct for a pet. Um, it, you know, humans, it's instinctual, but in animals, it really is. They eat to survive. So with, um, with that, obviously we kind of can roll into, okay, vomiting. Um, I generally, for me personally, I'm a worry wart. My pets vomit once and I'm like, okay, what's wrong with you? <laughs> okay. Um, a lot of people aren't going to be like that, but I would say. I'm any, not like that. Yep. Any more than two or three times in a day. Sure. Okay. Or even in a 24 to 24, 48 hour period, like that, that needs to be seen. Um, diarrhea that doesn't resolve within 24 hours because they can dehydrate so quickly. Um, cats, a big one with cats is they hide, like they will disappear. Okay. They might be out and about normally. And then all of a sudden you're noticing where is fluffy? They hide. Um, that's what they do. Um, dogs might be more clingy, but those are probably, you know, those are going to be kind of our top highlights. There's a whole list that can go into more, but it also comes down to intuition. <laughs> is your, is your dog or cat themselves? You, you know, your pet. Okay. Um, you know, when they're normal and when they're happy versus, oh, that's different. Yeah. My dog usually comes and greets me at the door. They're not coming to greet me. They're just laying on the bed. They're not even wagging their tail. They're not happy to see me. Your brain is going to tell you, Hey, something's not right. Okay. And so behavior is going to be important. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because you know, the issue that I have with this question is I have three kids with my first kid, I remember calling the pediatrician. Built uh, every little thing. Yeah. I, 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 one <laughs> yeah. conversation in particular was, uh, they were like, hey, what's wrong with your baby? And I was like, she's crying. 
and like, okay, well, what's wrong? I'm like, no, no, no. She's like, she's really crying. She's, I've never heard. And I think it might be internal bleeding. <laughs> They're like, <Lord>. what? <laughs> Your baby is like three weeks old and crying. She's fine. <laughs> so, um, the way we end up stopping her crying is I was like, okay, well, I'll clean the house if because I can't sleep. So oh we, I turned the vacuum on and poof. Went that stopped sleep. that stopped crying immediately. Oh my gosh, so that's just funny. a little aside. Yeah. So uh, now that we have our little dog Toro, he's about a year and a half old right now. It's cute. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, we we feed him, we walk him. You know, make sure he has plenty of water, keep him comfortable. Uh, he has, let's say, he's thrown up twice. Um, but I'm like, eh. But my Toro tends to eat things. Like in, some dogs like to chew. I guess. He likes to just eat it. Like bad life decisions, like swallowing a sock. Yes, exactly. Like swallowing a sock. We call those puppy bad life choices. <laughs> so, you know, obviously, like, so when, if they eat something, then they're not supposed to. And, you know, you have one of two scenarios. They're either going to be able to pass it um, <laughs> okay. out the other end. Um, well, three scenarios. Pass it out the other end, it'll come back out the front end, um, okay. or it could get stuck. Yeah. And it can cause a blockage. Um, and then in that event, basically, like, the dog will still want to eat, like, in the first, like, in the first day or so. They'll okay. still want to eat, um, but everything's going to come back up because nothing can go down the track. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so that, you know, that actually turns into quite a serious emergency if they're yep. not seen uh, soon because at that point in time generally surgical intervention may be required okay so getting to a veterinarian if you know that your dog has eaten like if you've seen it yeah um and there is vomiting and they're eating their food and it's coming right back up okay um and then as soon as they stop like they stop trying to eat you've it's almost like you've passed that point where now we're dehydrated okay now we can have other problems other organs and start getting upset and it can i mean honestly it can make it to where you get into surgery and it's much more complicated sure Foreign, bo- they're called foreign objects and foreign body surgeries, yep. but those are probably one of the most common surgeries I perform on emergency. I would guess so. Um, I've pulled a basketball out of a dog's stomach. Twenty socks was my limit out of a ridge back once on emergency, um, and then I think there was a weird little like pumpkin thing out of a lab once, and I don't know why that stuck with me because there's been <laughs> hundreds of these surgeries, <laughs> okay. but. Um, but basically, it's like intractable vomiting. Like, and they'll drink water; it'll just come back up. Okay. Or they're dry heaving, and nothing's coming up, and it doesn't stop. But these are, you know, these are things that hey, they need to be seen. And you know, you might say, well, hey, there's been a lot of times at Toro, it's come out the other yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But in those events, you know, he's able to pass it, and he's probably he might have vomited once, but then he's able yeah. to eat and keep something down, so okay. we know things are moving. Okay. Um, if we're eating and everything's coming back up and this is going on for more than 24 hours, you know, those are the times when you want to reach out for help because waiting not only puts your pet in more of a distressed state kind of internally, yep. but other organs start to get involved. Yep. And then we end up having to spend more money because we're playing catch up at that point. Okay. We have to address the hydration. If we get into surgery and the tissue is really unhappy, that's a high risk surgery and you know then we're looking at days of hospitalization versus you know we get in we get out you go on fluids for the night and go home the next morning okay. most surgeries are going to be uncomplicated but the longer that you wait the worse things and the more expensive things can get and it will hit you hard in the wallet okay so personal soapbox i did emergency for about three years before i opened my clinic so okay at the specialty hospital at sugarland so we saw, I can't tell you how many cases where people waited and it was tough, it's tough, tough, tough. So at, at what point should, I know this is a big question I, I see a lot on our, like our community Facebook page on the, what is an emergency? So it's going to vary. Um, it's, you know, there are so it's two, two in the morning yep. at two in the morning, Toro makes weird sounds, throws up. Um, does he go back to sleep? Is he pacing? Is he uncomfortable? Okay. You know, if he can't settle, um, if it's like one vomit, we go back to sleep. Um, we're probably okay. Okay. If it's a vomit and the next thing you know, he can't get comfortable. He's pacing. Um, he's passing really awful gas. Um, okay. 
and he won't settle. Yeah. You know, like that, like he's telling you something, gotcha. something's wrong. Okay. Um, but emergency is going to be different to a lot of people. I would say there's a lot of cases when I worked emergency where it was like urgent, but not emergent. And it's hard to make that distinction Correct. when you don't know. Um, obviously, uh, bleeding, <laughs> bleeding from, sure. from any or orifice, uh, mouth or the other end is not good. We yeah. don't want blood coming out of the, either one of those ends. Um, not being able to stand or walk is a okay. big one. Um, like I talked about intractable vomiting where they can't stop yep. or diarrhea that won't stop. Um, those are probably the most classic that we see. Um, okay. Obviously, you have hit by car or tra sure. like trauma. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, with cats in particular, they're really common to uh, be able to. They have what's called a urinary obstruction. So okay. male cats will make it to where they can't urinate, and the only symptom that owners will see is it looks like they're constipated. They'll be in the litter box straining and sometimes crying. Okay. And what people don't, they come in saying their cat's constipated. And the first thing that I think is I need to palpate the belly and I need to feel like the bladder is about to explode. Okay. So like, that's probably one of the most common cat emergencies okay. we see is gotcha. blocked. Yeah. Um, respiratory so, distress. I'm going to throw that one in cause we live in Texas and it gets hot. Oh, so, yeah. um, heat stroke is a really big problem. Um, if your dogs, like if you're outside, especially for our flat faced dogs, Bulldogs, Frenchies, um, <clears throat> Bull Terriers, uh, like Bostons, Pugs, um, they can't handle the heat very well. But if you're out and they can't catch their breath and their tongues are like brick red, yeah. um, vomiting, heavy drooling, you know, you get them inside, get them cooled down. And if within five minutes they're not cooling down and they're not kind of reaching back to normal, then I would, I would get them to a veterinarian. Okay. Okay. Switching gears just a little bit outside of the emergency, yeah. when someone comes and visits you like on an annual checkup, what questions do you wish your clients would ask? Okay. So probably the biggest problem we see in the pet world is um, obesity. So okay. Um, our we see pets, that as in the human world too. <laughs> uh, it's it's across species. Um, you know, our pets are usually most of them lead a fairly sedentary lifestyle. They go out for walks, especially our cats, uh, because they're just you know, they're they play, but they spend a lot of their time sleeping. Yeah, sure. And so, and and oh, some of the cats they love their food. Some dogs love their food, and we as humans start to feel like feeding our pets is a sign of love. And our pets start to get bigger and bigger and bigger, which puts strains on their muscles, their yep. organs, and they won't live as long. So I would love to be asked, you know, how do you think my pet's weight is? Because there's a lot of times when clients come in and we have an obviously overweight animal. <laughs> okay. And if I bring, I have to be very gentle how I bring it up because it can feel really personal. It can feel like you've done something wrong. Yep. And that's not the goal. The goal is to work together to get a plan to say, okay, I'm here to help support you and making sure that your pet, this, this part of your family is taken care of. But I also have to do it in a way where you feel comfortable that it's not being judged. There's never any judgment. Sure. And sure. I will be the first to say that I'm a veterinarian and I, I have a fat cat at home. Okay. So I don't throw any stones and it's, it's hard. You know, keeping our pets and healthy and like thin and lean yep. is hard. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, last vet question for you. What does a healthy human pet relationship look like? So the human animal bond. Okay. okay? Um, you know, it's a, it's a give and take. Uh, yeah, that's kind of an interesting question. I think of our pets as giving us uh, unconditional love. Yes. Uh, they're there. They take us through some of the hardest, darkest points in our lives. Um, and they are there. And that is, you, that, there, that is the bond. Um, there is no, there's never judgment. It's, they are there for you. Um, so I, I don't, I think the perfect human animal bond is going to vary person to person, but I think the main point of it is that they get our love, but they give us so much in return. Sure. So much, um, companionship, 
um, an ear to listen to, yeah. support if we're sad, um, joy, they feel our joy when we're happy. Um, like, you know, a lab, like a lab will, if his family's super excited, yeah. he's going to be spinning in circles. Yeah. You know, a, you know, my cat's very bonded to me. If I'm sad, he's, he's going to be in my lap. He's, and he'll glue himself to me. Like I won't be able to go anywhere, um, with, without him. Okay. And he comes and works out with me. Like he comes in the workout room and I don't, he, I, he's with me all the time. They're a huge part of our lives. So I think a healthy human animal bond is mutual respect, realizing that, you know, they are living, breathing beings and they give us a lot of love and it's our jobs to take care of them as well. Okay. Very good. Very good. Last question for you. Um, I know your life is very stressed. Uh, you've got to take care of yourself Correct. physically and mentally and emotionally. Uh, tell us something that you do to help help with your health so i generally try to i like in, the endorphins from working out are good <laughs> okay love it um i wish i would do more weight training i'm more of a cardio girl but um and when you say cardio what does cardio look like to you so i alternate between like my elliptical uh rowing and a bike okay uh, my husband goes and runs outside and i'm not I'm really not an outdoor kind of working out okay. girl, uh, <laughs> um, but I do, I work out inside, but cardio is generally my thing and it has strength training with it, but it's, you know, that's how I turn my brain off. That is my 20, 30 minutes to turn everything off and just, you know, focus on me and it's, it just gives you a, a time to take a breath. I mean, even if you're out of breath. Yeah, sure, sure, it gives, sure, sure. It gives your brain time to take a breath. And when you get done, you get, you know, you get your endorphins and you feel more settled. You sleep better. Yep. So, you know, working out is a pretty big part of my life. I also read a lot. I'm, I'm a huge bookworm. I'm cuddling with my cats. That's good therapy. Okay. Yep. Love it. Yep. And hanging out with my husband and wine. Wine, wine is wonderful in, in moderation. <laughs> Wine is good. Wine is good. Wine is good. Wine is good. So those are generally how I kind of make sure my mental health and refill the cup. I love it. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, thank you Appreciate for the questions. Learning as much as I could. Probably too much. No, no, no it was good. <laughs> it was good. Well, thank you, uh, and we will talk to you next time. All right, sounds good. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, guys. Bye. You can get every episode of Busy People Getting Fit wherever you listen to your podcast or on YouTube. You can also reach us at busypeoplegettingfit.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.